Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here today. Today, my guest is Jack Shirley, who, if you're not familiar with him, Jack has worked with a ton of great bands, uh, such as Def Heaven, he's worked with Loma Prieta, Jeff Rosenstock, and he also runs the Atomic Garden Studio out of the Bay Area of California. Jack is definitely someone who has a really refreshing approach to recording, especially in today's day and age with digital recording. Where most people are going to the digital realm, Jack is actually moving away from that and moving way more into analog. And he's also much more about just getting raw DIY recordings as opposed to what a lot of producers will do, which is tracking everything track by track and going very meticulously into the sessions and editing everything to sound super tight. Jack is very much about just capturing a band's raw sound. So in this conversation, we get into a lot of that and it's a lot of fun. Jack, before we recorded this, he told me that he loves to just like nerd out about gear talk and about processes and stuff like that. So we definitely get into that stuff in this conversation. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump right into today's episode. Jack Shirley, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How you doing, man? I'm I'm great. Thank you for having me. Awesome. For people who might not know your background and who you are, can you give us a little bit of background on kind of how you got into this, what you do, and uh, you know how how you got into music? Whew. Uh, so I mean, we can do the long or short version, I suppose. But I mean, I, I got I got into music as like a um, you know, as a, a 13 year old that was alive in 1994 when, when like the, when it's like some of the greatest music of that decade came out, it was one of those things where everybody wanted to play in a band, you know, it was like, like Dookie and, uh, Smash and Ill Communication and the fucking, I don't know, Weezer Blue album, I think was also that year. Like, like there's a dozen records that are like life changer records that came out, uh, when I was 13. It's like, what a time to be alive, you know? That was a great year. There was so many bands that came out that year. I totally Absolutely. That. So like it, that combined with, uh, I, w- I was, a uh, a pretty avid skateboarder in my youth and and um you know skate videos are another thing that are just like absolutely loaded with diverse music um and you're being exposed to all sorts of um different genres and styles and and whatever and some of it's underground and some of it's mainstream and whatever but you're you you get you get tons of it because you watch these videos over and over again and anyway so yeah i was i was exposed to a lot of music through all those um avenues and started playing when i was young and and um i didn't really get into recording until later not seriously we did some like kind of gorilla home stuff um stringing a bunch of like you know pa heads together and tracking into like a, a tape uh the tape deck of my like home stereo that sort of thing but like i didn't get serious about it till i got a small Pro Tools setup in 2003, and um, yeah, it was one of those things where I was like, "Oh, I'm just gonna get this to mess around at home," and then and then I quickly got like got the bug and got like deeper into it. And within I don't know within a year or so or a year and a half of um, of getting a computer and uh, like a in a Pro Tools like system of any kind i was paying my rent from recording bands out of my out of my like bedroom or you know my little like in-law unit that i lived in at my parents house that's amazing man like so many people i feel like so many people feel like they need to take their sweet time with like building their skills before they even attempt to work with a with an artist and the fact that you just jumped all in that 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 says a lot about your personality and, and your skills as well right well, I, I started on my own stuff, you know, and you do a lot of the, like uh, trial and error and all that. And and, um, and again, and, and when you do start working with bands, it's like, uh, you know, in my case, it was just my friends and, and they were happy to get a recording of any kind. And it wasn't like I was charging. I might not have charged anything actually right at the beginning. You know, I think um, this was back before iPods and all that stuff. So it was, you know, checking a mix in the car meant you have to burn a CD and you had to go out to the car. So like, I think I asked the first band I recorded to just bring me a spool of CDRs because that was the move. You'd go, you'd burn a CD of a mix you're working on uh, and listen to it for like 10 seconds in the car and then just throw it on the floor and go back inside because it's like, oh, this sounds like shit. So yeah, I mean, you, you just start small. You start as small as you can and um, and go from there. So yeah, d- no, have no fear. Uh, just start working. Totally. I, I absolutely remember those days of like, you know, 
like CDRs being kind of the, the the thing to to reference around the house with and all that stuff. And yeah, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you followed something similar to I like what I did was, you know, I, when I started working with bands, I was like, hey, if you buy me a mic, like I'll record your record. Oh, you that's, know? Like, yeah, that's awesome. Something like that, you know. <laughs> it's like, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a way to do it. It's like I don't know how I'm going to use this mic. I don't know anything about it or like this compressor, but I, I know that I th- I think I need this, so I'm going to learn it with this project. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. So for you, like you, you got into this as a musician and you said you, you play guitar, right? Yes. How do you feel like your ability to play an instrument has influenced the work that you do now? Oh, it's huge. I mean, I mean, even just from the very, very beginning, right? Like when you guitar players are, are like notorious for being like tone tweakers, you know, and you're like chasing tone for your whole, your whole life, uh, as a guitar player. And, um, and recording is really not all that different. So when I when I first started, it was that simple. It was like, well, I know what I want this to sound like, but I don't know anything about the process. And so it was just a, it became, you know, tweak it till it's right kind of thing, and learn you learn on your way. Say so so that I don't know. I feel like I, I feel like it in that respect. Guitar players in particular are kind of cut out for being engineers because you already have like that knob tweaking, like tone chasing bone in you. You know, so there's that. And then, um, and then, yeah, just knowing music helps you communicate with musicians and you understand what people are, you know, experiencing in the studio and how to, how to deal with that and, and whatever, and how to navigate, you know, just the whole thing. So, so yeah, no, it helps a ton. For sure. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And I, I think you're right with the fact that the tone chasers who get into this in this industry, like those are the people that learn really quick and, you know, you, you learn all this stuff on your own, right? Yeah, yeah. I had a I had a friend who was like a um a bit of a Pro Tools uh guru who who was my he one of my best friends. Um and he he was kind of my twenty four hour tech support when I was learning Pro Tools. So he was there to help me with the software end and, and with some gear stuff, but but in terms of like the actual like trial and error of learning to record music and like make it sound right, uh that was pretty much like a you know, just a, a trial and error thing. And I, I would, I would add also like these days, there are so many educational outlets for this sort of thing. And there wasn't any of that stuff, you know, 18 years ago, uh, like, like services like, like this, even like podcast, you know, or like, um, or like mix with the masters, which I, I, I still watch, um, you know, like even as a professional engineer, um, None of that stuff existed. And I remember getting recording magazines when I was young and just getting into it. And all I wanted to know was like technique. And there wasn't really anything about technique in magazines. You know, like interviews are just about, you know, oh, I heard you worked on this. So that's cool. Or like, you know, it's just filled with a bunch of ads, you know, for gear. Like there wasn't much that like dove deep into like, this is how I mic a kick drum or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, So it's, it's, it's amazing that all those things are available now, but, but then it was kind of just like, you got to just figure it out. And I imagine too, that like, you know, when you're, when you're self-taught, you sometimes kind of learn your own sound as a result of that. You know, you, you kind of, you don't have the, I think one of the common trends that I've noticed with this podcast is that people who are self-taught, they, they haven't learned rules to follow like so-called rules. So, so they kind of like learn to mess things up and do things the wrong way. But like, find some happy accidents as a result of that. And then through that, that kind of shapes into some of their sound. And, you know, it, it really does create something unique and, and different. Yeah, there's there's definitely a curve. Like when I listen back and I think back to the, to my how my process has gone, like when I didn't know anything, uh, you, d- you like don't know enough to mess things up. You keep it really, really simple and like whatever. And then as soon as you start to like, you know, your your brain goes like oh if you put two microphones on that guitar cab it'll sound even cooler than one microphone but like you're so wrong about that uh like when you're or like you don't know how to do that even mildly correctly so like you just do it and like you have a sound that ends up being smaller than your one microphone setup but and you don't really know why and you don't really hear it at first you're just like cool i got two microphones now on for guitar um and uh yeah so, so there was like the, the early recordings were like, oh, this sounds pretty good. And then you fast forward a year or two and it's like, ooh, this sounds kind of worse. You know, like what happened? Um, and then, you know, even now I'm still figuring it out. There's, there's still stuff to figure out, you know, like forever. <laughs> 
Absolutely, for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing that to me, like, I know you have a very DIY background and you're into the punk rock stuff. And, and I, I love the music you've worked on. I can definitely see a lot of that punk influence. And one of the things that I love about the Sound of Your Productions is the way that you use saturation. And I think that, that that's something that a lot of people who are self-taught kind of they read about the red light and they they're afraid of it, you know, and they never touch saturation. Um, but it seems like you're you're a pretty big fan of using it. It sounds like, you know, when I listen to a lot of your recordings, I can I can tell that like the drums have been smashed a little harder and that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why you like saturation so much and kind of um, when you're applying saturations, do you have any tips for finding that fine line between too much and not enough? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for the, the kind of music like you're talking about, like 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 more indie music like uh punk rock and hardcore and some metal and like indie rock or whatever like there's there's often an ex- any kind of extreme music too like really like nasty kind of hardcore stuff or whatever you're always on this line of of pushing it to the point where it's about to be too much but then like finding that sweet spot you know so like it, you're you're always looking for that like that last bit where you're like oh yeah damn that's crazy but it's not fucking everything up you know but uh i i would add again when i first started uh, it, everything i everything was digital you know i had a pro tool system as soon as i was able to save up i i, I got an hd system and all that stuff but for the first i don't know a few years or at least a couple years everything was just digital so like i liked the idea of saturation but i didn't have any like good tools to actually achieve it that was kind of a, a little bit of a roadblock and it was also before there was good plugins that would do that sort of thing like nowadays i can you know like i grab the a, a, a whatever tape emulation i'm using or like a tube emulator or some, something you know like um you know, Decapitator is a very popular one. Or like I use that UAD Studer a bunch um, if I'm using software. But uh, as the years went on, I got more and more into the analog side of things. And that's when it all really started to kind of pop. And, and when I, and, and, or when I got, um, you know, when I got my first outboard mic preamp, like EQ channels, it, it, and they had output trims on them, it was like a whole new world of like, oh man, like they, they were like kind of like Neve knockoffs. And it was like, you could, you could just drive them as hard as you wanted and then back off your output and, and not clip Pro Tools. And, and it was, that was like a whole new like set of tools right there, you know, um, especially doing like, yeah, like punk rock music, people like distortion, people like saturation, myself included. Um, and it does add a lot of like, uh, you get a lot of weight, you get a lot of like, whatever compression but like it, uh, it when you use it right saturation doesn't sound like compression you get the effect of compression but without the like any any like artifact or like grabbiness or whatever the things that the things that people don't like about compression and so yeah uh and as we go on and on you know i i i um i got more and more into analog hardware until i eventually was kind of like you know what i need to try I need to try some tape and I found, so I found a tape machine that was like relatively affordable and it kind of went nuts from there. You know, I started with a little two track machine that I was mixing down to. And then as soon as I could, I got a two inch machine and started tracking to that. That was a little over 10 years ago. And still I prefer to track to tape and to work totally analog while I'm tracking it at the very least, because, um, because of the way it sounds and the, in the workflow of it and all that. So, yeah. So even, even in my current setup, I'm saturating at, at like, uh, at the mic preamp, I'm saturating maybe at a compression stage or, um, um, with some kind of outboard thing, I'm saturating the tape. Um, although I found like, I don't know, I found different ways to do it that are, that, that become a little bit less like heavy handed. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. Well, I, it's really interesting too, because you said that you started digital and now you're going analog. And I feel like for so many people, it's the opposite, right? And and there's obviously like a convenience with digital as well. Um, how do you utilize analog in what most people would consider like a digital world these days? Like, you know, how do you decide what, what you're going to keep in analog, what you're going to do in digital? Or is it just is it just all analog at this point? When I first started integrating the 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 tape like workflow into it or or even just analog hardware into the picture, it was uh, it was very much like, you know, get the capture with with whatever analog front end and immediately dump it into Pro Tools was like, that was just like the safest way. Because when you first, when all you know is digital and then you start to use a tape machine and you have no visual of like waveforms or anything like that, it's scary. And, and you don't, you, you feel like you're kind of like missing some crucial piece of the puzzle. And it turns out it's kind of 
it's pretty awesome because you don't have a visual thing distracting you the whole time. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. No, that's a really interesting point. Like that, that definitely, I think, trains your ears to hear things in a way different Absolutely. way. Absolutely. But uh, I've gotten to the point now where I pref- when, when I'm tracking, there's usually not even a computer uh, involved. So like I, it's a, it's console, two inch tape machine, a bunch of outboard like compression and whatnot. That's the end. That was my end game was I wanted to be able to make a record without a computer. I wanted to have that that capability in my studio. So it required a, a good deal of equipment. And I have that now and I have the option to, to make a record completely without using a computer, um, which it doesn't happen very often. But when it does, I'm glad that I'm able to do it. But um, but if I go back, though, all the way to when I decided that I wanted to be ready for that this this end game scenario that I'm now in. I started kind of training myself early on because when you're recording to tape, you need to do the majority of your processing. Not the, you need to do a good deal of your processing on capture, meaning that like if you're going to EQ something or compress something, you need to do it while you're recording it and print it with that stuff on because with with analog tape, you have a noise floor which is, you know, hiss. Um and it's a pretty substantial noise floor depending on your setup. And so, um, and that doesn't exist digitally. So digitally, there's kind of no consequences. If you like, you could record just a microphone into a preamp and that's it. And 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 you get what you get and you can do whatever you want to it later. Um, with tape, it's not like that. So if you, if you recorded something, say like at a relatively low level with no EQ or no compression, you're going to end up with um, playback with a, with a, 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 a like, What's what's the word I want to say? Uh, a scary amount of hiss, you know, like but like a uh, where where it's it, and then typically you think about your moves, right? Your EQ, you're going to brighten something up a lot of times, and then compression, you're going to you know you're going to compress things. And when you brighten something up, you're you're raising hiss, and when you compress something, you're you know you're pushing down transients and then bringing up the volume, so you're then raising the hiss even more. So the more you can do all that stuff on the front end, um, the the happier you will be later. So I started training myself for that early on where I would set up a session in Pro Tools and have a bunch of um, like auxiliary channels that had EQ and compression on them because I didn't have any outboard. And then I would print through them to to my audio track. So I would get used to the workflow of having to like EQ and compress on, on capture, which is like kind of daunting for some people, especially in the beginning, you know? So were you using it as like a kind of like as a backup, like you were splitting off the signal. So you had a clean and then you had one that was effective. No, no, I would just, I would go, I would commit. Um, and, and, and I didn't, you know what I mean? Like, because that's, that's the thing, right? If you do, so say you record, you know, drums, bass, guitar, vocals, you do it a dozen times, you start seeing like, oh, actually, like you start seeing the moves that you make when you're, when you're setting up your mix, you start seeing the processing that you're doing. You're like, oh, I, I'm compressing this, this way, you know, maybe I'm doing like, whatever, I'm doing 3 dB compression, I'm using this kind of attack and release for like a kick drum or whatever. Um, you, you don't need to do that, you know, you can do that a dozen times. You're like, oh, well, I might as well just do it while I'm recording it. You know, fi- figure out what the loudest is thing's going to be and set my threshold accordingly and and boom, you know? And if I know I want it to be brighter, like as soon as I hear the tone, then like I'm going to make it brighter on on um, capture. And so I do that now. So when I so when I re- record a band now, there's no computer. Um, it does require a lot of outboard equipment to do this, but like, you know, um, any given signal, I'm EQing and compressing to taste to get the to get the the tone of any given thing like as close to the final thing as I as I can um, on capture, and it gets printed to tape that way. And so, um, obviously, there's always going to be adjustments you're going to make in the mix, but um, but I think I do probably eighty plus percent of of my processing on capture. That's amazing, man. Well, I think it makes sense. It's like you know, I I'm a big like I, I really believe in the idea of having a vision for your songs before you even start recording. Yeah, you know, like as far as like understanding like what your arrangement's going to look like, how it's going to sit in the stereo field, what like you know what the balance is going to be frequency wise, all that kind of stuff. So, to me, it doesn't make sense when people don't commit upfront because it's just kind of working from a disadvantage. It's like you're you're kind of just throwing things together, hoping that you can make it work in in post, but you can definitely make mistakes in that as well and kind of paint yourself in a corner. Right. So, so yeah, I think the idea of like committing to sounds, I should add, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm also tracking like 90 plus percent of the time I'm tracking the band live. So you also have the foresight of hearing all the things working together. Um, which I think is, you know, when people choose to not do that, 
it's a you're you've got even more of a guessing game. You know, it's like, well, this kick drum sounds cool, but like until I hear it with the bass guitar or you know, or the electric guitars or whatever is, is gonna be added, it's hard to really know how to make that kick drum sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you're you're hearing everything together, so it, it allows you to shape things a lot easier. Because you're right. Yeah, I mean, if you're just like if you're recording everything in isolation and you're starting to cut frequencies, thinking like, oh, this is what I always do. Maybe what you always do isn't the right thing for the context of your song, you know. So <laughs> I, I definitely can see how there's there's that um, that risk of like committing up front, but you know, I think in the case of what you're doing with the live off the floor, it definitely makes it make sense. It, it works well. So for like, for people who are like, I think commitment is definitely one of those things that a lot of people struggle with. And I think a lot of people know that they should probably do something or like they know that the recording doesn't quite sound exactly like the end product should be. So they they probably should be committing their sounds, but there's still a lot of people that are afraid of it. So, you know, what advice do you have for people who are maybe afraid of committing sounds during the tracking stage? That's it's fair. Um, And I guess even I'm, I'm trying to think like nowadays, when we're talking about just sweetening up something with with some EQ or compression, like there's no reason to be scared of that. Like most of that stuff, you can like counteract if you really want to. You know what I mean? Like maybe so you don't want you you maybe you wouldn't be doing like heavy handed compression and like in like really crazy EQ. You're you're like you're mostly just kind of like doing some broad stroke stuff to like make it sound a little bit better. And if it sounds you know and if it's like that sort of thing you can decide in the moment, you know, like, oh, this is, that sounds much better. Like, you know, I think we're going to be good. Uh, you will make some mistakes and you will, and like, and there'll be hard earned mistakes because like, oh, I fucked up this drum sound because I did too much. Um, and then now you'll know the next time that you shouldn't do that. But, um, at, at the same time though, uh, what, what even now, uh, some bands are super like, boom, do it. Yeah. Fuck it up. You know, like, like, uh, like a, a really good example is like, with with uh, a lot of music actually distorted vocals are like a thing right um and it can be an indie rock band that has just like a like a saturation that's kind of like prevalent or it can be like a um uh you know like a hard like a nasty like hardcore thing where it's like really distorted vocals and so for some bands the move is to just get it right right on the spot you know um and so like i use um i often use i have like the real life version of the de- decapitator which is the ampex 351 um it's these old like 60s tube preamps that have like so much gain and so you could run a mic in there and you can just just like distortion all the tube distortion you could ever want is going to come out of this thing and then i might also go to a compressor like a tube compressor that's going to saturate and then we're often going to tape which is also going to add its own you know depending on how how hot you hit the the tape um that's going to add its own saturation and compression and all that stuff and um and so yeah there's a handful of ways to go about it sometimes some people are like yes awesome that's exactly what we want and you just do it and you make sure to tell them hey i can't undo this later you know like we can always add more distortion we cannot you know take this off um and in the world of tape machines you know you've got 24 channels to record a band you don't you can't necessarily have a clean and a distorted version for every single thing you're doing um Although sometimes that is the move too, to like print two tracks and do it in parallel where like one, one track is just your normal vocal sound with maybe some, some like tasteful compression and like it's going to tape, you know, conservatively. And then one is your absolutely annihilated version that you can then blend in. Um, but in, and, and, and with digital, I guess you could do that forever and ever and it's no big deal. But, but I have to say there is some magic to just committing and just dealing with what you've done. Um, even if it is the wrong thing um so so yeah i don't know <laughs> it, it, it's gonna be scary but like who cares for sure well I, I think it also just comes back down to the trial and error thing right and you kind of you know you, you touched on it earlier you're just kind of identifying your trends you're identifying the things you do on a regular basis and and you'll you'll learn you know when how much EQ to have. And if it comes to saturation, maybe you're, maybe you are going to fuck up. Maybe the first time you do it, you're going to overdo it and you're going to quickly learn, okay, maybe I should ease up a little bit on the next time, you know? Um, but, but that's all part of it too. Totally. And you're going to find that like, there's some, like, uh, some saturation is like super duper forgiving, like tape saturation and distortion is like the most musical, beautiful thing that there is like two, tube saturation distortion can get kind of crackly and it can get kind of nasty um and then when you get into in solid state 
distortion saturation can get pretty gross uh, depending on what you're using. But um, so, yeah, you, you can learn to like lean on which ones more and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. That, that's awesome, man. I, I love that approach. And, and uh, it makes sense the way you're doing things. It totally makes sense to commit to that stuff right up front. And, and I, I think more people should learn to do that because it, it it just makes mixing a lot easier, too. Right? You said you do 80 percent of your processing up front. That, that must mean that your mixes go by fairly quickly, I'd assume. Yeah, they do. Well, so so back to the tape integration thing, right? And the hybrid thing. Um, so if if my average tracking session is primarily on tape, um, we eventually dump everything into Pro Tools, right? So the 24 tracks on the tape machine come down, come out into Pro Tools. And even then I might do a hardware, like some hardware inserting, like for the transfer. So like, you know, for a tape transfer, you're just playing back from one recorder, which is the tape machine and you're, and you're recording into another recorder, which is the computer. And so, um, that can be just a straight process of like press play, press record and let it go. Um, or, Oftentimes, I'll let the the tape machine play back through the console, and I'll have EQs on every channel that you know if I need them, um, and I can kind of make a couple of little like you know mix moves uh, as the transfer is happening, uh, and that's another thing. So like oftentimes, by the time the multi track is printed into Pro Tools, like yeah, there's not a whole lot left to do other than like push the faders and the panners around and like get you know maybe automate levels and whatever else. But um, but yeah, so. That's that's part of the hybrid thing. But but that being said, I do like to keep on tape in the beginning because it does force you to commit, right? 24 channels um, for, to record a full band's record means you need to learn to like uh, prioritize and be economical. And, you know, if you're using um, a console also or any kind of summing device, you've got to like you got to sum stuff together. You know, if I put two mics on a guitar cabinet or two mics on a bass cabinet, like that's got to land on one track on the tape machine because we don't have, you know, we don't have 48 tracks. We got 24. So like you, you learn to like get that stuff right. And, and, and like I was talking about before, like putting two mics on a guitar cabinet is, um, is a like, you're setting yourself up for failure because of the phase relationship between those microphones. And so like, um, and most people get it wrong, by the way. I mean, myself included. When, when I when like I get a lot of stuff to mix that that I didn't record. And when there's whenever there's more than one microphone on anything, it's always like you, you always have to double and triple check the phase relationship because it's almost always wrong. And so, um, so that speaking to that though, printing like two two guitar mics that are on a cabinet to one track where you literally can't do a thing to it like in terms of their phase relationship later is kind of scary you got to get it right um or else you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot with you know you're canceling out a bunch of your high end and and whatever depending on how how you how you do it but it's a mess so so yeah it's you're gonna fuck some shit up (laughs) uh on all along the way but but that's just kind of part of the process you know yeah it makes it fun it's like you know, you, you kind of have to fuck some, fuck some shit up to, to learn from it. You know, I I remember even like when I was in audio college, like our first semester, we, we had an amazing recording engineer teacher who basically was like, you have studio time and I'm not going to assign you homework. You're just going to go and fuck shit up. Like he was pretty much like, I don't care if you break our tape machine. I don't care if you break the console, just like try things and see what happens. And like, I remember some nights we were just like trying to make weird, like, analog tape loops with the tape machine and like all sorts of stuff and it was like yeah we fucked it up a couple times but we learned <laughs> it's like okay it's like this <laughs> luckily we have a uh, very forgiving tech at this at the school yeah. and he helped us out a lot but uh, uh, beautiful but yeah it, it was definitely a, a great learning experience um yeah i love i love everything you're saying here man um one, one thing you touched on briefly that i that i wanted to talk about a little bit more was uh the idea of recording bands live off the floor rather than doing that track by track thing um i'm curious to get your opinion on it because it seems like these days more and more people are going the other route and doing everything that, on an individual level this is something that i've done since like day one basically like the like my own band uh, was, you know, the first band that I recorded and it, it just, it just made sense to us to record all together because that's just how we, you know, we were most comfortable playing. And I should add that at that time I was recording my whole quote studio setup was, you know, I lived in a converted garage off the side of my parents' house. Right. So it was like, you know, it was the size of like a, I don't know, one and a half car garage, you know? Um, and it was, so the whole band recorded, 
like it was band practice in the same room, just pointing, you know, everybody's just like in a circle pointing at each other. Um, and so, and it, which is a scary environment to have to record things when you like, if you like, if you don't know what you're doing, you're like, Oh, whatever. Cool. I'm recording a band. We're all together in the same room. But when you do know what you're doing, you're like, Oh fuck, like this is going to be a mess, you know? Um, and so I guess because I did, I didn't know enough to, to be scared about it. We just did it. And it actually worked out like, super good and um and and because i started in in such a uh confined like untreated uh, like unseparated place um everything after that was just easier you know like like i could do that like i still do that i still record bands like that now um i just have a room that's much bigger and treated and we have you know baffles that go between amps and the drums and like all that shit but like um yeah this is a process that i very, very much believe in and that I push for every single time. And I, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't recorded a band not live in, in like well over 10 years up until like recently I did it for some friends because I was like, I, I did the one thing at a time, like hyper produced, like, you know, dr everything's gridded, drums are quantized, everybody's one at a time. Um, and I'll tell you what, I fucking hated it and I will never do it again. Like, like not only is it like super, super tedious and takes forever. Um, it also just sucks the life completely out of, of your, of like the record. You have, no, there's no like feel or like vibe. There's no like, um, push and pull of like the people looking at each other and like maybe the tempo speeds up at the chorus. And you know what I mean? Like, like there's so much human quality to people recording together and they don't necessarily have to all be smashed in the same room with all their amps and stuff like that i do it the other way plenty where like things are isolated and all that stuff but every, but the playing is live and that's the that to me that's the important part um and yeah you save a ton of time you have a ton of foresight because you're hearing everything at once uh so you can make all these informed decisions it uh it's i don't know man it's it's the it's it's just kind of the way you know like this is the way, uh, it, like, uh, to quote the Mandalorian. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's like the benefits so, so far outweigh any, anything like negative that could come of it. Um, but yeah, a lot of bands, when you tell them they can get in a room and not even wear headphones and just play their record, um, they're just like, what, what, what do you mean? Uh, and it's like, it's like, yes, it's that easy. Just go in there and play your songs. Like it's band practice and it's going to sound awesome. And they're like, and, and, and a lot of people are just like, I cannot believe how, how like comfortable and easy this was. Um, so yeah, do it. Everybody do it. There's a bunch that I want to unpack from that. Cause I think, you know, I think that, uh, there's, you know, when it comes to the idea of recording track by track, I think a lot of that has to do with the engineer and the producer mindset of, you know, being able to really focus on one instrument at a time and make sure that everything's like locked to the grid and that kind of stuff. So, so when you are recording a full band, how do you feel like, do you put a lot of pressure on yourself to still make sure that like you're, you're really making sure the band's locked in or do you, do you not even care? Like, is that like, what's your approach there? Uh, when it comes to performances, yeah, I don't care at all. Like the band is the band. They've practiced a bunch. They're coming in, they're playing together. Like they're, they are the ones that have to be happy. You know what I mean? Like, so, so, uh, when they come, so that's another thing to add here. So like when a band comes into the control room after they've done a live take of this nature, they're hearing like, especially if it's like a two guitar band and you're recording drums, bass, two guitars, sometimes even vocal live when they come in the control room they're hearing like 75 percent or more of what their record's going to sound like you're you know what i mean like yeah it's going to be sweetened up in the mix and we'll mess with the balances but like you're basically hearing what your record sounds like after you've just set up and played one song you know so now you've got all sorts of insight to what you might want to change or like if if or if it's like perfect you're like sick you're just you're excited you go in and you just keep going if it's like if there's things that need to fundamentally change you you do that um but you have that that foresight to, to, because of this scenario, you know, anyway, so I leave it up to the bands when it comes to that sort of stuff. Like they know if it doesn't sound right to them, you know, um, I never, I never am like, no, 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 you need to do that again. Like, oh, that needs to be tighter. Like, no way. Like anything that anybody's heard that I've worked on, like I had v little to nothing to do with the performances on the, on those records. I'm here to like capture the people doing the thing that they have prepared to do. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, it makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, I, 
I am kind of the opposite. Like I do track everything track by track. That's just kind of the way I, I got used to doing it. But I, I do agree with a lot of your points about speed and all that stuff. Um, and one thing that I definitely find when I'm done working with a band is that you get a lot of musicians who sometimes maybe, maybe this isn't a good thing, but the, who who realize after the fact, like, oh, we could become better musicians. Like we do, we probably could yeah. be tighter, <laughs> or, or we could pay, or we could pay attention to people a lot more. You know, I think that's a big part of it too. Like people, you know, guitar player not paying attention to, to the strumming pattern of the bass player, or the you know, bass not locking in with a kick and that kind of stuff. And sometimes when things are under the microscope, you kind of notice those things a little bit more, and it makes people more aware of it. So I imagine that with what you're doing. I mean, you're going for a pretty raw sound, it sounds like. And I imagine that it probably does require some pre-production before getting into the studio to make sure that, you know, at least at least some of those foundational things are locked up and and, and sounding pretty tight. Or, or, or is pre-production not even much of a part of your process? Well, it depends on the record, but usually it's not because most people don't have the budget to, like, do any pre-production. You know what I mean? Um, like, the band has... I, I request demos whenever I can, even if it's just an iPhone recording in the room and I request them not for myself, but for the, so that I know that the band has done it. Um, and, and demos with vocals is also super important because vocals often aren't worked out until the studio. And like, and when you add vocals to music, uh, it changes a lot about how the music gets played, you know? So like, um, so, uh, yeah, so no, I don't usually do pre-production. Um, most records, uh, the band comes in and does what they have prepared and that's the record, you know? Um, because there's not there's not a lot of time to like delve in and all that stuff and i and to add to what you're talking about the, when you when you are doing the one at a time thing um you are hyper focused on each instrument and to me that's that's part of the problem is that um when you're hyper focused on on any given thing any little like inconsistency or or like whatever, any little hiccup or is is seen as a mistake and then it's fixed. Whereas when the band is recording all together, uh, the majority of that stuff is just becomes part of the sound. You don't even hear it. You know, like if you, if you like some little squeak on your fret or whatever, or some like, or you, maybe maybe a note got like slightly muted. It's the kind of thing you would stop if you're recording by yourself and be like, oh, I fucked up. I got to fix this thing. But like, you might not, you might never even hear that on playback in in context of a full band. And um and all those little things are what what makes it all sound like a band playing. You know what I mean? Um. So I mean, yeah. And when there's like big mistakes get fixed, you know, like you can say everybody still can punch in. It's not like, um, that's a big misconception, by the way, people for some reason think that because of tape and because of a live setting that everybody's got to just play perfectly and there's nothing you can do about it otherwise. Uh, but which is totally not true. Like you can punch in, you can edit, you can, you can do, you know, you can do pretty much the, what you would do in a computer. Um, you can't do it on the fly and you can't get super duper surgical about it, but like, but you can, um, you can fix plenty of stuff. So it's not like, yeah. So just cause the band's all in the same room, even like if they're with their amps and whatnot, um, you can still punch in the guitars and the bass m the majority of the time. Um, so drums usually have to kind of get it right. But again, since it's all going to end up in the computer, m majority of the time it ends up in the computer. So like, uh, little stuff can be edited as well. You know, once it's digitized, it's all... For sure. Yeah, I was going to say, like, how much editing are you actually doing with it? I guess not much if it's still still mainly analog. Yeah, I mean, um, like, uh, you mean like digital editing? Like, once we once it's digital... Like, nah, like well, so I don't... Um, I, I will only fix stuff if it's a glaring issue or if it's, like, a requested fix. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't go looking to, like like quote tighten up a performance or something like that like during mixing um like the performance is the thing that i that's the one thing i don't want to mess with because it's like that's the thing that's unique to this band you know like um and, and if, if there's glaring stuff like like distracting things like oh somebody hit a completely wrong note here or like you know or, or like maybe uh i don't know there's an entry that's super early or something like that like oh we'll maybe clean that up but like but we're not looking to like reshape a performance you know yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Cool. I, I love that. That's, uh, you know, I think when you take that uh, that approach, you definitely are capturing the band for what they are and not for like the hyper 
produced modern thing or, you know, whatever. I guess it and also depends on the band's goals, too. Right. You know, if a band has a goal that they want to be on radio, then maybe they have to do it a certain sure, different way, sure. you know. But but uh, but I think that sounds like a lot of the artists you're working with. It's like they, they, they just are true to themselves and that's what they want. Right. So it makes sense to have that kind of process to follow. Yeah. And I mean, I'm trying to think of good examples of this, like like, uh, you know, like Jeff Rosenstock uh, and Death Heaven are the two biggest uh, bands that I record. Right. Um, and I can tell you, so like, I, I think it's probably it's guessed at that a rec- like a band like Def Heaven would do some pretty produced, um, you know, stuff. It's like, it's like fast metallic, you know, like whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's not at all what they've done historically they, on, on their newer record. They got a little more, they have I actually had a producer and they got a little bit more into the, that side of it all. But, um, but on all their previous stuff, um, it's a band just playing together. There's no click track. There's no like whatever the, the drummer is doing uh, 10 minute long songs that are like blast beats for minutes and minutes on end, like with no edits and no, no nothing. Like that's just what it sounds like. It's live to tape. It's a bunch of guys just playing together. Um, so I don't know. It works. It, it works. It, that's another thing. That's another thing too. Like you were talking about, there's a, there's a ton of music out there and we're looking to get more and all that. And like everybody loves music, but at the same time, if you can make every band sound like they're awesome, um, then it, there's, then there's no, like no one rises to the top anymore. You know, like when, if a band comes in and they don't sound great or they don't sound tight or whatever, like that's just what that band sounds like. You know, like I have no qualms with like, just letting that like being the person that like is the conduit to the world of like, this is what this band sounds like, you know, like love it or leave it. And when a band sounds amazing and their arrangements are amazing and like all this stuff, like everything just clicks and the playing is beautiful and everything, you know what I mean? Like that's because that band is good and like they deserve to be, uh, heard that way. You know what I mean? Um, there's, there's a lot of bands out there, so there's gotta be some kind of natural selection. For sure. Yeah. I love that. Like, it definitely sounds like you, you take on more of a, like in, in, I guess, modern terms, I, I hate the term producer. Cause I feel like it gets tossed around in so many different ways, but like, I, I, it sounds like you're more of like a traditional engineer when it comes to working on projects, you know, where you really just focus on like getting the best sound out of it and, uh, you know, letting the band do its own thing. Whereas, you know, these days a producer might be the person who is kind of getting into the nitty gritty a little bit more in terms of like working on arrangements and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, it's, it's definitely refreshing to hear someone who's just like, let's just make awesome music. I, I love that. Um, so, so yeah, we've talked a little bit about your, your recording process and, and even some of the editing a little bit as well. I'd love to shift gears into the mixing side of it. So when it comes to making a mix and getting started with it, like what's your mindset going into a mix? Like, how do you start? Where do you start? Do you have like a typical process that you follow with mixing? So yeah, it depends on, there's, there's two kinds of mixes for me. There's the mix that I tracked and then there's the mix that somebody else tracked. Um, and I've there these days it's about 50, 50, what I get, you know? So like sometimes so there's things coming from all over the place. Um, and then there's things that I did here. So, um, the stuff that I get that other people record, um, typically needs a lot more processing because those things were often tracked digital, um, without much maybe analog gear, you know, on the front end or whatever. So like they need, it needs processing. It needs like the full, you know, treatment. So, um, in that case, I have software versions of all the hardware that I have in my, in my room. And so I treat it like I'm recording it basically like, and I, and I, I drop in all the stuff that I would use if I was tracking a drum set or if I was tracking bass or guitar. Um, and I do it as software because I've shot myself in the foot way too many times where like, you know, I've gotten a record and I've done a full outboard pass where like it all runs into the console and not out to all this, this cool stuff in the room. And then somebody's like, oh, we needed to do some drum edits or something like that. So here we're sending the drums again. And it's like, oh, fuck. Um, and so th- that that has happened enough times where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to work this up in the box um, because everything's infinitely adjustable. And the software has gotten so good. The plugins have gotten so good um, that the things that emulate my hardware that's in my room, um, when I go to grab for the plugin version, I'm pretty satisfied. You know, um, I do still prefer the hardware and I use the hardware when it's, when it makes the most sense, like when I'm tracking and, or when I'm mixing my own stuff, uh, I might use more hardware, but like, but anyway, so 
generally I get somebody's multi-track. I draw, I have a template, um, not with settings, but just with plugins, um, that drops in all my signal chains for any given thing. So like, you know, whether it's, you know, kick drum, snare, whatever, whatever, whatever. And again, it is, it's the literal, for the most part, it's this, it's the hardware that I would be using in the room, including tape emulation for a lot of this stuff. Um, and then, and I, I'll, I'll work up the tones the same way that I would if I was tracking a band and we were getting tones, you know, like whatever. Um, so I do that. And then, um, and then I have a pretty like involved summing chain. So I'm doing, um, analog summing. Should we get into that? Sure. Yeah. Let's get into it. It's, it's something that I think a lot of people, a lot of people in this digital age don't really know much about. Right. So, or, or they don't have the ability to do it. So yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit more about so, that. So, okay. So summing is the act of you're taking a multi-track of your mix, which might be, let's say it's 32 tracks or something like that of drums, bass, guitars, synths, vocals, whatever it might be. Um, the act of turning those multi-tracks into your stereo mix is called summing. Uh, and the, um, Typically, it's done when it's done digitally. You're summing with using a virtual mixer that's in your DAW, right? So you're taking your multi-track, you're printing it, or you're exporting it to the stereo printed mix, uh, and it all happens inside the computer. So that's digital summing. Um, analog summing is when you take your individual channels and you f- you go out of your your interface of your hardware, and you might go into any array of things like there's tons of summing boxes now where it's like 32 ins two outs basically or something like that you know where like uh, the whole the whole job of this little thing is to is to make an analog sum of your mix and it spits out the stereo mix and then from there you could do you know whatever you might do so um over the years i've been through a handful of these things because as my quest for analog kind of like developed i was like oh well analog summing like let's get into it so um i think i had i had three different summing boxes of varying quality and and uh style and all that stuff um and where i landed is on the fourth one which is an actual just full scale analog console (laughs) because it, it sounds the best um but and there's passive summing there's active summing there's it's a whole it's a whole thing. I don't know how deep to get into this stuff. What do you think? I, I love it. I, this is great. I, I, you know, I actually, in the back of my mind, I, I, it made me remember that I was thinking about getting like one of those uh, analog summing boxes for myself too. Just, I don't know if you ever seen like the DIY RE, like that website. Uh, yeah, they they have one that I've I've just had an eye on. Like I've never really I, I don't really do analog summing. So I saw that box and I was like, this looks like a little cheap way to try it out and see see the benefits of it. Yeah, you know? it can be daunting, right? Because so 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 the people that I've talked to about it that are like the kind of gear pros, like like Shadow Hills is a um awesome company. They make a really cool summing box. The Peter from Shadow Hills, his takeaway was like, yeah, analog summing is rad, but it doesn't really start to make a difference until you're like upwards of 16 channels, you know? So like a 24 to 32 channel summed, uh, analog summed thing, like you hear, you start to hear the difference a lot better, you know, the separation of everything and like the stereo width and just whatever, the way it all kind of glues together. Um, but for a lot of people that's tricky because now you need an interface that's got at least 24 outs and, and that can get expensive quick depending on what you're doing but anyway so i went the passive summing route so passive summing right is like a box that's got a bunch of inputs and then it has like a um some bus bars so like it's it's doing the actual summing passive without any active electronics and then it spits out your stereo mix out of the out of the other end and then you use some sort of amplification usually mic preamps to to get the level back up because it's like super because of the passive process you lose like tons of uh, gain. And so, um, so you would go out of your interface, say 24 or 16 channels or whatever it is. Um, this passive summing thing happens. Then it goes to two, two channels of some kind of mic pre, sometimes if you're choosing, depending on what you're using, sometimes it's built into the box and then the amplifiers, uh, you know, bring it back up to level and they add color or whatever. Right. So this is cool. For me, it wasn't enough of a, of a thing, you know, like it, it was like, oh, this sounds better, but it's still pretty clean. And it, often they have, there's like kind of infinite headroom where like, if you're looking for saturation, like I often am, um, it's hard to get that in, in, the, in a, in a passive summing scenario. For sure. And it would largely depend on your preamps as well, right? Like how much gain you can get out of those two, I'm guessing. Well, not, yeah. Not to mention though, that like 
so say you're do in the passive summing scenario, your your amplification is only on your stereo mix at the end. So if you're going to saturate it, you're saturating your stereo mix only. You're not saturating any of the, of the individual channels, right? Which is what I was looking for. So like the next thing I got after I tried a couple of the passive things was the Chandler mini mixer, which is a, a, effectively a line like mixer. It's it's the rear end of a console. So like now you have an amplifier per channel of of the summing mixer right so um so now there's like instead of just uh, uh, uh some line amps at the air like mic preamps at the end now you've got a line amplifier and a transformer or whatever it might be um on every single input of this summing mixer and so in this case it was 16 ins two outs is how it works right and then you've got and you've also got amplifiers on the two outs so now if you're coming out of your um daw going into this thing you can you can drive say channel one is my kick drum coming out of my out of my daw right I can drive it out of and like push the amplifier um, similarly to how you would push like a tape machine or whatever and now you're starting to get some saturation on your kick drum um, analog saturation going into your semi mixer and maybe your snare hits hard too on an, on channel two. Um, and so now you can like your whole mix can kind of like hit a bit of a ceiling but in a way where it's not gonna like. Um, gum up it's like the mix isn't isn't like oftentimes if you saturate a mix just just the mix itself things start to get messed up kind of quick because like maybe if the kick drum hits got a lot of low end it's gonna it's gonna make everything kind of duck a little bit or it's gonna like fart out your mix a little bit um and kind of like it's just not for most people it's not the desired effect um some people by the way ask specifically for that but um but anyway so I found that the active summing thing, if we're going to call it that active versus passive, uh, that was my shit because now I can like, I can go out of Pro Tools and I can calibrate my outputs, um, out of my like interface to where like before I clip the output of my, of my, um, interface, I'm clipping the console that I'm going into. So now I can drive the console as hard as I want per channel without any digital artifacts um and that's where i'm at right now so 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 let's so we'll co go back right so i've done i've gotten some a mix to work on i've done a bunch of channel processing with plugins and now i set up my my analog summing chain um which these days is an api console it's a 32 channel api console so um and and i have it set up where when i push up my fader or you know my uh, my my digital fader um, in in Pro Tools. When I push my kick drum up before it can go red in Pro Tools, it can it will go red on my console. So now I can figure out like just the right amount of um, of analog saturation uh, that I that I want for for my mix to hit this multi track across the the console. And I should I stop and is this good? Or like <laughs> no, this is great. This is great, man. Like, I, I love this. It's, it's almost like you're using your analog summing as another mix stage, you know, almost just, just for saturation. Absolutely. And so, um, so, so the, the API, um, stuff has a like really nice musical saturation to it. Like it, 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 it this doesn't always work as well with any piece of gear, but like, but this works well. Right. So, um, I usually sum across, let me look at this. I'm summing across 32 channels. Um, and so it's all hitting the console relatively hard. Um, and then out of that, now I'm in the analog world with my mix, right? So like I'm, I've, my multi-track, uh, 32 channels worth is coming out of my computer individually going into this console. The console is turning that into a stereo mix. And now my stereo mix is analog. So now I go to analog compression, analog EQ. I have a tape machine that I print to. Um, and then that all comes back to the computer as a stereo mix, right? Um, and, and that analog chain that's my master chain is pretty involved and it's doing a lot. And, 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 and I should add that that thing is in play from the beginning as well. So like my, my, my master EQ, my master compression, that's all stuff that's set up before I even start pushing faders up um, because it shapes a lot of the sound and it's like, it's just part of my process. Yeah, I guess you, you already know what your mix should sound like when you have that working properly, right? So that's, it makes sense to have that on right Yeah, now. and it gets adjusted per mix, but like I have a starting point where I'm like, I know that I want to bring the high end up on the whole thing, you know, some degree. I know I need, I, I want to do some compression. Um, I know it's going to hit the tape machine to some level, you know. Um, I'm also doing a, a bunch of outboard um, 
EQ or not uh, outboard like reverb sends and returns and stuff like that. I, there's some plate reverbs that we have at the studio. I have a, this old spring uh, AKG spring. So like I'm also doing some sends and returns from Pro Tools where like I'll, you know, I'll send whatever um, from like the vocal bus or something like that uh, to one of the plates and then the plate returns on the console so it's like it, all that stuff is now part of the part of the summing chain as well that's cool man that that's like i love that you completely walked us through that process and it definitely makes sense like the, the advantages of the 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 summing so so in the end you know it it sounds like to to you the the real advantage of the analog summing is in the saturation of it all right like is for anyone who's who's maybe considering getting into analog summing and whether they should be doing that is you know is that really the advantage there is it is it only analog summing or what are the other advantages that you would say no i mean so the saturation is like a taste thing but like analog summing has i think has been pretty much proven to be a worthwhile process um you can do it in a really clean way too but the um the the uh the like signature that comes from it is going to be less and less noticeable i guess um but the things that people often hear in analog summing is like oh the 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 separation of instruments seems more clear the stereo field might feel like wider you know what i mean like you might get just like more fidelity um like the mix might feel a little bit like deeper a little bit whatever brighter depending on the the box you're using there's a there's like a dozen of them that are all you know um worthy of checking out but but yeah some are super clean and and have been criticized for being like not different enough to, to be worthwhile you know from digital yeah i guess if you're going to spend the money on it you want to hear some sort of difference right, right right um i did really enjoy the uh the shadow hills one it did sound very good but again it had kind of infinite headroom because it was a passive summing bus so i was like i was looking for more uh, to be able to drive more into it. Um, the Chandler one was really good, but it was in the end, it turns out I just wanted a console and it wasn't a console, you know, like it was, it, you know, um, but it sounded fantastic. Those, those were some of my, that, that was my, maybe my favorite one of them, but, um, but it's also, you know, when you get into this stuff, it's really expensive too. So that's prohibitive, but, um, but actually, and then now, uh, now that I just think about it, like, like universal audio is like, um, they're doing that whole thing with like console emulation now as part of their their software um yeah and that's that's crazy i mean like the whole vision the api thing like i haven't used it but um but i do use a bunch of the, of ua's um api like i use their full line of api plugins because i have all that stuff in my room the 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 analog versions um and i'm i'm very often you know in a pinch i'm grabbing the plugin version and i'm i'm super happy with what it does it does what it's supposed to do that's great. I mean, hey, that, 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 that's what they market it as, right? So it's good to hear someone who has that experience of using both and oh, man. saying that it actually is, it's right? So, <laughs> like, the this, this stuff, especially over the last, I don't know, whatever it's been, five years or something like that, when the, the DSP, like, capabilities grew, the um, and they started modeling distortion into all their plugins, you know, like, the way that it happens in, in real life. So, like, their, the 1176 stuff, the LA-2A, the tape um, emulations, and... Yeah, they read it all of them. Dude, they're amazing. They're absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, if, if, if I was never, if I was never, uh, able to use any of this like physical analog gear again, I would, I'm sure I'd be perfectly happy with that software. Um, because I do use it all the time. That being said though, like if in a world where I just never used a computer again to make music, I'd be really, really pumped. Um, but that's not, <laughs> the, that's not the world we live in right now, but, uh, but you know, that's okay. Yeah. So if you if you were to start all over again, would you still go the analog route? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm telling you, like if if things get too like crazy with like um, whatever, either the schedule is getting too overwhelming or like bands are wanting to do too much like hyper production, I'm just going to stop using the computer altogether and just be like, no, nah, I just don't do that anymore. Like we're just going to make records with, you know, with tape <laughs> and like, and, and just live with it. No, I, I absolutely love that. I, I, even, even just the, um, outside of the sound, like the, the, the sound benefits of it, just the workflow of it. I like, um, you know, the fact that you can't fix every little thing on the fly and that you have to wait for it to rewind, um, that you like, you know what I mean? Th that you have a track limitation. So you can't just like infinitely layer things and you have a time limitation. Like that actually, that's a beautiful thing. I noticed this. I, we have two studios at this new spot and, um, I walked into the other dude's room not that long ago and I, he was tracking a band and I looked on his, um, 
they were doing like one song or, you know, for the day or something like that. It was somebody came in to do like a single or something. And I looked on his computer and he had like 10 takes of the same song, you know, across his timeline in Pro Tools. And I was like, holy fuck, dude, what is that? And he's like, he's like, oh, they just want to keep everything. And, and, that, and uh, that's so foreign to me because for me, it's like, hey, I've got two reels of tape for you guys to use for this you know, um, for this session, it's about an hour worth of material. So it's like, and, and maybe they've got 40 minutes worth of stuff to record, or it's an hour worth of tape rather. And maybe they got 40 minutes of material. And so it means that we can't keep every single take that they do. You know, we can't even keep two takes of everything. We can keep one, we can keep an extra take of the occasional song. If you think, you know, we need to try another one and you could be, you might not be able to do it better, that sort of thing. So, um, but to me, that is so awesome because there are some bands that I've worked with where they're like, they'll get a song and be like, all right, that was really good. Let's do four more, you know, like, and, and keep them all. They want to listen to all of them. Um, and that's like such an insane waste of time. My, my whole thing is like, get in there and play the song. If it feels good, go to the next song you know, and do that until you've, until you're tired, you know, like, and if we get through all the songs, great, then we'll stop and listen. If you want to redo something, you can redo it as many times as you want, but we don't need five versions of, you know, takes of a song to listen to and then argue about which one's better or whatever. So, um, and, and, and I find even just something that simple that, that is a limitation brought on purely because you're using tape. Um, it, it changes everything because now everybody's fresh because you're bouncing from song to song. You're not getting bogged down by doing one thing over and over again. Um, you're also like, uh, I, I don't know. There, there's, um, there's, uh, a benefit to like not hearing the song right after you track it also like if you're going to go through 10 songs and then stop and listen to everything those songs sound a lot different an hour after you played them versus like 30 seconds after you played one you know what i mean um your perspective totally changes uh and the thing that you thought maybe sucked about the take that you did it's actually oh i didn't even hear it i was super concerned about this one part and like it sounds totally fine and, and like i hear that a lot and so, um, so yeah, all this stuff stacked up on each other. I'm like, damn, like, why do I even need this computer here anymore? You know, like this is, this is doing like, we're getting everything we need from this, but it turns out you do need, definitely need a computer. Um, because most people can't like, it's hard to get a band all in the same room at the same time. Um, so mixing is most often done remotely and, you know, obviously without a computer, I wouldn't be able, like I've been this whole last year, uh, especially I've been mixing stuff from like around the world, you know, um, that wouldn't happen, uh, otherwise. So yeah, for sure. You, you definitely need something. It's interesting. Cause I think you're right. Like, you know, when you have an analog system, it forces you to really pay attention to the takes that you have and just, you know, make the decisions of what's good and what's not. And like you said earlier, you can always punch in if something messes up, you know? So the idea of recording five takes of vocals just for the sake of having five takes, like there's really no point in that. It's like, if someone fucks up, then obviously you fix that. But you know, there's the most of that when you're, when you're comping your takes, you're maybe taking like one lead take anyway, and then peppering in a couple of things that you want to fix up. Right. So, you know, you can easily punch that in an analog, which is great. Totally. And, and when it comes to the overdub stuff that, that can be a different story, depending, I'm mostly talking about live takes of the band, um, where like, where, where they'll want to do a bunch of takes and listen like vocals. Uh, that's a case by case thing, I guess. Cause yeah, some people you do need to comp and you might need at least three, um, full takes of any given thing to really comp some stuff um and that's all possible on tape too you know even like uh i've had a, some bands really really commit to like we're not going to use a computer for this record and some of them were very unlikely where i wouldn't i wouldn't have expected that and and um it's always been this like incredibly rewarding process where it, it is more work um and it it, it doesn't even necessarily take more time. It can take a little bit more time, but but like it's all about making decisions because um, we haven't even touched on the idea of mixing a record analog, especially because I, I don't have like my system that I have is all it's a manual console. There's no automation or anything like that. So that's a whole other beast, uh, which is it's and again, it's really, really fun and really rewarding. And the, the, the records that I look back on where there was no computer in play, um, the like the i have such fond memories of the process and you think of all this cool stuff that happened while you were doing it but it's definitely not for everybody especially these days when people are used to like infinite you know 
flexibility and like like what do you mean we can't turn the hi-hat down you know it's like no man we printed mixes with like no recall you know like this you guys you have to learn learn to love it is the is the saying that 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 gets tossed around a lot but um yeah i i I love that man that's great it's so it's it's interesting because you know i when i think of analog my gut tells me that things go slower but it's probably not true because with digital you can definitely go a lot you take a lot longer to do things because you you want to redo them over again because you have those options and you know that infinite pos- infinite possibility thing can definitely slow you down. Um, when it comes to like finishing mixes for you, like how long would you say it normally takes to get a mix done? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. It, that it's that's super dependent on the record. You know, like some some people send stuff or like you might record a band where it's like it's just drums, bass, guitar, and vocals, you know, like, um, in which case it's pretty easy that you could blast right through that. But, um, I tend to, I have to work fast because most people just don't have a lot of money to spend. So like, I, I have to, uh, you know, you have to fit it into the, the budget that's available. Um, but like, I don't know, I guess, uh, I don't know, <laughs> um, a couple of days to do like your average full length, um, is probably, realistic um that being said some bands need a week to mix a record you know what i mean um but i guess i guess on average like on the lower end i could mix a record in a day and a half to up to like three days would be like uh, uh, your your average one and then occasionally you get some that go way long and they're way more involved but, I mean, that's fairly quick, right? I mean, that's probably, I'm guessing, a couple hours a song to mix, you know? So I'm assuming you're probably leaving your board kind of in the same positions to, like, once you've kind of set up your first mix, that kind of sets a template for the rest of well, it? So is that, is that with true? the analog summing thing, the board is in a static position always. Um, and all the moving parts happen in the software. That's another thing to know, I guess. So, like, w- with an analog summing uh, scenario, the board, the, even, even if you're using a console, the console acts as a summing box, the same way that you would use one of those boxes that, you know, like all the faders are set to zero, you know, to set to unity gain. All the panners are set to however you decide. Usually like I have some in mono and then most of them are in stereo and you send stereo pairs to the console. So, um, that's all totally static. So, um, also I, I have the habit because I'm used to tape when I'm setting up a record, I set it up all in one session. So, um, so I, 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 I treat the session almost like it's a reel of tape basically, you know? Um, and because for the most part, uh, and this is a record by by the way, where like the tones are consistent. So like if, you know, if the drums and bass and basic stuff was all tracked together, then you can set this, the, the record up across one session and then just work on, um, you know, incidental things as they come so you know like maybe there's a lead guitar that needs a different treatment on this song and that can have its own track you know or whatever or like but like but if for the most part things are consistent and the goal is to have the record sound consistent then i do it across one session so it's i it's um people often ask about that like what's the price per song it's like i don't have a price per song it's like my price is just my hourly rate so like i i I don't know how long it takes to mix like one song uh in in the scenario where there's 12, you know, like I can tell you how much it takes to mix one song by itself, but like, but that's because the setup that goes into it is the, you know, like that's the bulk of the work. Um, and when I'm mixing an LP, I do the same exact setup on the first song or whatever. And then theoretically that setup now applies to the whole record and you have this global starting point, kind of like what you're talking about where like, yeah, you set up your board or whatever it is with this, like you got your tones, you got your balances. Um, for the most part, most bands, they just, that they want that applied to the whole record and then adjust, uh, adjust the, the, the extra things as they come. So, um, so yeah, so I don't know, I, I don't know about time per song because so much goes into the initial setup and that applies to the whole thing. Yeah. It's kind of like miking drums, right? It takes, it takes a lot longer to mic a, dr- mic up a drum kit, but once you've done it, you're ready to go for the rest that's of the exactly song. That's exactly right. So it's it, like anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, that, that's interesting. So, so then how do you, like, how do you decide when you're done a mix? Oh, um, yeah, that's tricky. Uh, that's super tricky. So like when, when I'm first getting started, I try not to get too deep into it because the band's got to hear it, you know, and, and like give me some feedback. And if they were sitting here, I would get to a point where I get the basic tones and basic balance going and I would turn around and I'd say like, What's, what do you think? And so usually I could take maybe, um, whatever it takes, uh, the first half of uh, maybe a half a day, maybe a full day to like just get everything organized, get the, um, 
get the basic tones set up, get my summing chain and like my outboard stuff happening to where I'm like, all right, this feels presentable. And then before I do anything more, I print it all and I send it to the band to like get some feedback. And sometimes, sometimes the band's like, damn, this sounds like a finished record. Like we're done. Don't, don't even change anything. And sometimes I'm like, oh Jesus, like I didn't even start, you know, I barely started. Um, but like, and then sometimes people are like, this isn't even close to what we're looking for. And you have to kind of just like zero it all out and kind of start again. So it's super, super dependent on the band. Like, but the mix is done when the band says it's done basically. Um, so, so yeah, cause I've had, <laughs> it, it's a weird thing. Cause sometimes, you, you know, I'll do the four hour setup or whatever and send it to the band and they're like, oh my God, it's perfect. Don't change anything. And I'm like, oh shit. Um, and then, so, but, but, but it's like, but Hey, maybe that's it. Maybe, you know, maybe that's all it needed. Um, some, some stuff doesn't need to have like t- meticulous, uh, tweaking. Yeah, absolutely. You, have, you definitely have to know kind of when to stop and, and when to just ask for feedback to, to make sure that you're, you're in the right ballpark. Totally. Otherwise, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll tweak forever. Yeah, right? absolutely. I'm curious, w- w- since you're largely analog there, I, I'm assuming that drum samples don't really play a role in any of your productions. Well, okay. There's, there's two answers to that. One is since almost all this stuff ends up in Pro Tools as a multi-track, like once it's there, it's no different than if you had just recorded it to Pro Tools. You know what I mean? Like, uh, other than it, it sounds better, but like, but, um, all the same capabilities that you would have for any digitally tracked thing are there. Um, I just don't use drum samples cause I don't like them. You know, um, I would, I would much rather like tweak what I've got. Um, and because when, when you get into stuff like that, like whether it's quantization or sampling or uh, pitch correction or whatever, it's this like super fucking tedious process where like the computer can kind of do some of it, but you have to double check and triple check everything. Right. Like, like you can drop samples on something like on a drum kit or whatever, but like, it's going to it's going to drop some of them off time and it's going to have a weird, like it's, if it doesn't flam, it's going to have a phase relationship with your mic track, which I would, I would never throw out. Like uh, samples would always be something that would be like tucked in to, to reinforce, not to replace anything. Um, and so, uh, in, in part of this could be my ignorance because I haven't used a sampling, like a drum sampling, uh, any program in so long that like, I just remember when I had to do it or, or even when I've, you know, when you use Melodyne or something like that to, to tune something, um, you have to tr- like double check every single note basically to make sure that it's doing it the way that like a human would do it. You know what I mean? Um, For and sure. that fucking sucks. You know, it's like it, it, <laughs> it, 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 and most of the time it sounds fine. Well, so what I, what I will do though, I tend to work, uh, even when I'm in the computer, I try to make moves as if I'm not in the computer. Right. So like, um, rather than doing like a kick or snare sample, I'll make duplicates of my kick and snare track. Um, like I would on the console and I'll do a parallel, a uh, set of like really heavily gated um kick and snare tracks um to like to blend in and and they it basically acts as samples you're getting rid of all your um your cymbal bleed you can eq if you want like to do some crazy moves you know that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise um you you know whatever you can mess with the volumes of them and all that stuff so um i'm kind of doing an analog version of that i suppose um but but yeah when it comes to all that like all that stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm it, mostly just not a fan. And most bands don't have the time that it takes to really do that stuff the way that it, you know, that like you have to. Like, like tuning vocals can take that could be a day for an LP. You know what I mean? Um, and like most bands don't have a day to to burn on on tuning their vocals. You know, so um, that that sort of thing. So um, so yeah, I try not to. I try not to do any of it, to be honest. Like, if if somebody really wants it, I'll do certain things. Um, but but for the most part, I I, I yeah, I just I don't really believe in it. So my heart is not in it. You know, like <laughs> I don't I don't want to do it. But I think that that's what makes you unique. That's what people hire you for. Like they they know the Jack Shirley sound, and that's what they want. That's true. It's part yeah yeah yeah. That's true. Uh, sticking with this since like because when I first started, right, two thousand three was like a horrible time for production for a lot of or like or like the late 90s early 2000s when it came to heavy music anyway was a pretty embarrassing time right and it, and it was the it was like the the dawn of like all this all the stuff we're talking about time correction pitch correction sampling uh whatever like tones were bad mixes were bad recordings were bad and then like until something like jane doe comes along right you're familiar i assume and like 
is a is a hundred percent analog record in the midst of all this embarrassing shit. And then and it's like, oh wait, cool. We don't need to do this. Like, you know, like somebody somebody pulled off making a, a super modern, super heavy record and it's timeless sounding. And like 20 years later, it still sounds awesome and not embarrassing. Um so like to me, it's just kind of like great. I, I decided back then I don't like any of this this trendy like the 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 kind of fad like production stuff, and I never learned to get good at it, and I, and I kind of like steered away from it. And as a result, yeah, I don't I don't know. If it, it's just like the band, the 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 people, the clientele that comes my way. They're just like minded people who are like they they don't they just don't want any of that stuff. And the music that they're playing doesn't um it doesn't really cater to any of that stuff, you know, like, like a, like a grungy indie rock band doesn't want drum samples. You know what I mean? Like they don't, or they don't, they don't want like time correction. Like they don't even want to play to a click track. Um, and so I'm like, that's where I'm fully on board. You know, it's like, damn, this is like, that's how I personally prefer to make music. And so it, it definitely spills over into, into engineering world, especially since I don't really play music much anymore. Um, this is mostly my, my only thing, you know, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely like a sound that the bands are going for and, and, uh, the rawness is is a big factor in it you know it's like if, if you imagined like sample replacing like drums on like a pink floyd record or something <laughs> like that you know it just it totally sounds so yeah. weird right yeah <laughs> what you had mentioned um that you kind of have two different scenarios when it comes to mixing there's the projects that you've worked on yourself and then there's ones that other people send you um and I, i'm curious to know like when you get sessions sent to you for mixing what problems do you frequently see in the way people are submitting their files like or in, or in their recordings that you notice you, you mean like file management or like recording quality? It could be either. Because I'm not like a super high priced, high profile type of dude, uh, the stuff that I get is often am amateur recordings, you know, like maybe half the time they're done in pro studios by professionals and then half the time they're done at home by people who, who are just doing stuff at home. And like, um, so I get all very wide variety. So, and sometimes the files are such a mess and like the organization of the session is such a mess that it could take an entire day just for me to get it to where I've wrapped my brain around it and I can start mixing. Um, and so, and, and I mean, that means like no processing of any kind has happened. It's, it's like purely management of the session, like just organization and just getting, you know, like maybe they did a bunch of punch-ins, but they didn't do any crossfading, you know, like, so everything pops all over the place or there's like, um, or they submitted like, a bunch of Pro Tools sessions that are like arranged completely differently per song, even though, all the tones are the same, you know? So like now I've got to go through them all and like make them all, like I got to make them all into one session for my own workflow. But then I've also got to just organize each song because each song is completely like a mess, even though it doesn't have to be. Um, so there's that end of it. Uh, and that can be, a, that can be really like frustrating. But then um, the other end of it is the audio quality end of things. And I can tell you this, most of the time, I wish I was there to put the microphone in, in a different place. Um, and, 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 and there's not, there's nothing you can do about that. And so like, and that's the, that's the thing. It's like, I, I'm very much like outside of all this cool shit, analog and EQ and get this on the capture and tape and all that stuff. The, the most important thing, like underline it 10 times, all caps is the sound of the source and the microphone choice and placement. There's nothing, nothing more important than those two things. Right. So, um, and oftentimes there's nothing you can do about that not going right. So just take an example, like a snare drum is a perfect example. Okay. So like the tuning of a snare drum and like the, in the teching and like dampening of a snare drum is so much more important than what equalizer or what microphone preamp it goes through or any of that shit. And where you put the microphone on that snare drum is it just as important, right? So, um, so if somebody sends something where like they didn't dampen the, the the snare drum at all, and it's got this crazy ring to it that's like in everything, it's in the overheads, it's in like every you know every mic on the kit, and like so you got this now you've got this thing to negotiate. Maybe they also put it in the, the mic in the wrong spot where like it's getting you know. 50% of what you're hearing in the microphone is hi-hat bleed. I've gotten stuff where the hi-hat bleed is louder than the snare drum in the snare drum mic, you know? Um, these are all super, super duper important things. And again, way more important than anything you're going to do in the mixing is like, if you get that capture right and you put the mic in the right spot and the source is sounding the way that it's supposed to sound, like it's really hard to fuck things up after that. Um, you have to like actively work to mess things up, you know, when, when you get all the, all the, the capture, right. So, um, 
So yeah, that's, but that's a, that's the difference between people being like, you know, I'm a person who's done this on a daily basis for almost 18 years, um, versus somebody who's just starting to do it out of their house. Like there's going to be some disconnect, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and a varying in, in quality, but yeah, but source quality, microphone choice, microphone placement, so, so important. And I almost always wish that I could have been there to, to like, you know, I've had people send stuff where there's like four microphones on a guitar cabinet and none of them sound good. You know, like they're, they're, none of them are in phase with each other. None of them sound good where it's like, if you had just taken the time to like get, get the amp to even sound good or right, you know, in the first place, put one microphone in a really good spot. Now you've won, you don't, you know, like instead of worrying about setting up four, um, cause you think it's good or you want to give me a bunch of choices. It's like, damn, cause that, cause that's often what I'll do when I get a session and there's like, there's just a shitload of mics on everything. I just go through and start just like, you know, just muting things and taking them out of the session. It's like, I, I, the last thing I ever want is four microphones on a guitar cabinet. So, um, so yeah, it's, I don't know. It's a mixed bag. <laughs> that being said, I mean, some of those recordings can have turned out great. Like some of the stuff that I've done that I didn't record are some of my favorite records, but, um, oftentimes I'm just, I am definitely left wishing that I had just been there to be like, ah, man, your amp sounds like it's underwater. You know, like there's no high end. We need to like adjust your amplifier or we need to like tune your snare drum it's way too low or it's way too high or whatever you know it needs a gel or something on it yeah absolutely i, I love that that's i think i think that that's, that's actually a great spot to end this on because you're right it's like you just got to get things right at the source and doing that makes everything so much easier you know analog or digital it doesn't matter like you need to have it right at the source because everything builds on that you know i it, it and if you're going to edit things later like you still need to have great recordings so that you can make the edits sound even tighter and better, you know, and then that makes your mix easier. So it's, it's all, it's all relative to each other. And it's super important that you, you nail it at the source. So I, I love, I love that you brought that up and that you really brought emphasize that <laughs> point. Yeah. It's a, it's a big <laughs> it's one. Awesome. Uh, yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. yeah t- like tuning vocals or whatever, like you, it, you, you have to be able to sing well to be able to get your vocals tuned, you know, like you can't just go in and just kind of like shit something out and then like make it into gold, uh, with, with some pitch correction software. Yeah. It's like, all that stuff you got to be you have to be you got to get it right as best you can you know uh, on, on. it's the entire signal chain like from the musician to the to the mic choice to the position all that stuff it, it all impacts the recording so the more you can be prepared and the more you do it right at the source then the, the easier everything gets Awesome, man. Well, Jack, uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. Um, and I think you shared so much awesome information here. If um, if people want to follow you online and learn more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? The studio that I work at is called The Atomic Garden. And there is uh, theatomicgarden.com. And there's um, there's two Instagram um, accounts because we have two studios at this new spot that are independent of each other. And so um, the rooms are the East Room and the West Room. Um, so there's Atomic Garden East and there's Atomic Garden West on um, on Instagram. I am the East Room. Um, but yeah, you can f- follow it, Will. Uh, there's not a whole lot of <laughs> like uh, f- new or fun stuff on there, but uh, but but yeah, come on, come on over. All the gear nerds can see the photos of the awesome gear. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And lastly, uh, are there any cool projects that you're currently working on right now that you can talk about? Oh man, uh, yeah. There, I mean, I I work on probably ten plus things a, a month um you know and sometimes it's just mastering somebody's like ep and sometimes it's you know tracking a whole full length so there's always something and it's and and i'm always super excited i'm just looking at my calendar right now so i can tell you oh actually just speaking uh, to just today the new um king woman lp was was um is like they're starting to promote it and it's an amazing record i highly recommend everybody checks it out uh king woman is the band the record's called um celestial blues and uh and man, it's awesome. We we worked real hard. Uh, they're a group of extremely talented people, and I think people are really gonna like the record. It's heavy as hell. It's dark, and it's like, and um, yeah, it's really really good. Uh, well, let's look though. Let's see. Oh, there's a new Tony Molina record almost done. Um, there's uh, we just finished that Jeff Rosenstock ska dream that was super fun. That record sounds awesome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so that was a great example of st- that was that was I didn't you know record any of that stuff. Uh, it was all done by a bunch of people like around the country, all sending their stuff in remotely, and uh, it was all in great shape. It was a super easy mix to to do. I mean, it took a long time because it's an it's an involved uh, thing. You know, every song's different, but um, but yeah, it was 
it was super super fun i love jeff i love d- being involved in anything that that he's uh doing oh let me recommend this one record for everybody out there that is still kind of like on the fence about like recording live um and i'll tell you a quick story about this so this band is called winsome it's spelled w-i-n-s-o-m-e all one word you can find it on um spotify i'm looking it up right now it looks like the record is called solitude um so these dudes came in um just recently and or i guess maybe there's only one song up right now and the song's called solitude um but they came in so this band recorded 100 percent live in the studio okay they're a three-piece it's kind of like kind of chiller kind of indie rock stuff um they recorded drums bass guitar and vocals 100 percent live without one punch in for the entire record and um yeah and it was it's amazing it sounds so goddamn good um and so what what you're hearing if you listen to this song how often does that happen where you get a, a full take of like no mess ups it's ha- you know what it, it happens more often than you'd think uh how but it, it what doesn't happen often is a whole record of no punch-ins um and and that's only happened a couple a few times for me but like uh but anyway so this band when you listen to this song it's it's um the drummer and the bass player are li- and the guitar amplifier and and bass amp or whatever they're all live in a room the singer who's playing guitar and singing is in a booth with his you know his amp is in is is in the live room and he's singing and playing guitar so what they did they ran through their songs the singer then doubled his vocals and his guitar in one take uh like again you know just doubled everything through the whole record that was it that's the entire thing that that they, they, they I don't think they've put the full LP up yet but the one song that's up you can go listen to it and that's what it is. It's a, it the, the band played live, the singer doubled the guitar and the vocals at the same time and that's it. That's the whole record. And it sounds amazing. So yeah, so that that's what's possible. Um that so that's the last thing I just saw that on my on my um on my calendar. I was reminded of that cuz I was like god damn, that's awesome. Um the there's a new Loma Prieta LP in the works that'll be out. I, I don't know when um, that's about to start mixing. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's always some stuff brewing. Um, uh, what else? Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's that. Awesome. have to definitely check those out then. Wicked man. Well, Jack, thank you so much for taking the time to, to do this podcast episode. And there's so many great tidbits that you taught here. And I love like how deep you went with the analog summing thing. I don't think anyone has like I've heard people mention it on the show a couple times, but no one's ever gone into the depth that you did. So oh, cool. it's uh, I think that's definitely going to be a really helpful thing for people who are considering it. So so again, thank you so much for taking the time, man. Of course, really thank you it. for having me. Awesome. All right, so that was my interview with Jack Shirley, and that was a lot of fun. I really love the conversation uh, about analog summing, and I love the detail that he went into, really talking a lot about his process with it, how he connects everything, why he uses it, the advantages that he sees with it, and even getting into the nitty-gritty details about active versus passive summing. I found that really interesting, and I'm sure a lot of you guys will as well. And if you haven't experimented with any sort of analog summing, then I definitely think you should revisit that section of the podcast and listen to it um, because you might find that it's a helpful thing to implement into your mixes. I know it's definitely got me thinking a lot about getting into it myself. I did buy like an old analog mixing board years ago. I just bought secondhand, but I needed it to be fixed up. So maybe it's worth investing in that because I, you know, I really do think that uh, after talking to Jack about this stuff, I think that that might give me a little, a little different of a flavor with my recordings and it could be a lot of fun. Or even like Jack said, there's a lot of other devices out there that you can use for analog summing. And I know that uh, one website in particular that has a really cheap option is DIYrecordingequipment.com. It's a great website if you're into the DIY stuff and building your own gear. Uh, they have a little passive summing mixer there too. So something to look into if you're interested in analog summing. So that was a lot of fun. And hopefully we can get Jack back on the podcast because I know that we both could have gone a lot deeper with this stuff and uh, probably chatted for for hours about this stuff because it's a lot of fun. So thank you for sticking around to the very end. And if this is your very first time hearing about the Master Your Mix podcast, definitely make sure to check out the website, masteryourmix.com, which is where I help musicians create pro sounding recordings from their home studios. And on the website, we've got lots of videos and blogs and all sorts of helpful resources that are going to allow you to make better sounding mixes much faster. And one of those resources is something I call the Ultimate Mixing Blueprint, which is a cheat sheet with EQ and compression. So definitely make sure to check that out, masteryourmix.com. And when you get to the website, you'll see a little pop-up to download your free copy of the Ultimate Mixing Blueprint. All right, guys, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for sticking to the end, and I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Take care. 
Thanks for listening to the Mastery Remix Podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.